Keith and Judy. Let me correct something I said earlier. Eddie and Lori are both just that much younger than I am. I think that's what Eddie was muttering over there. I wondered what in the world. What is he talking about? And I figured that's what he was trying to say. But uh, it's not enough to worry about, but it's, it's a minute or two, I think, they're younger than I am. Take your Bible to Malachi. You say, well, where in the world is Malachi? Well, find Matthew and turn left. And the first book you get to on the other side of the New Testament page is the book of Malachi. We don't go to the small minor prophets very often, but we need to today. For those of you who have not been with us, we're, in the, we're, we're ending a series today that deal with convictions. This is week number 14. And uh, I'm not going to go through and name all of the things that we've talked about our convictions that we need to, the things that we need to have convictions about. But, but this morning, I, I think this one is very relevant. And, and in fact, I, I, was, I was sent this note this morning by our daughter. 
and, uh, and I'd ask her a question is why I got this note. But, but here's what it said in the, in the text that she sent me. She, the, the note said, Christian financial expert Howard Dayton has said that the Bible references money and possessions 2,350 times. That's more than love, more than heaven and hell combined. And then a new paragraph started and said this. He said, it's almost as if God knew that we would need lots and lots of direction and clarity on the whole money and stuff issues. And then Mr. Dayton wrote these words. He says, doesn't he know us well? And to that I say, amen. Now, there's a, this is not on the screen. I'll, I'll get to the screen stuff here in, here in just a few minutes. But there's a little verse of Scripture that's tucked away, and we ran across it a couple of months ago or three months ago in our study of the book of Acts. And, and we find it in Acts, the 20th chapter, and the 27th verse. And Paul, he's, he, we know he's kind of the main character through all of this, and he's talking to Luke's the one that's, he, he's the one, sending out the text and the tweets of everything that Paul is saying. But Paul is saying in that little passage, and he's talking to the, to the elders there, and, and he's, he says this in that 27th verse. He says, for I have not shunned. And that word shunned means I have not avoided to tell you. And then he says this, or to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Now, if all we did was stand up here and preach God is love, we would be preaching truth, wouldn't we? But we wouldn't be preaching the whole counsel. If we stood and we preached on heaven and how great heaven is, we would be preaching the truth, but we wouldn't be preaching the whole counsel. Because not only is God a God of love, the Scripture says He is a God of wrath. Not only is there a great heaven that he's going to prepare for us, but there's another place called hell that wasn't made for any people, but was the Scripture tells us was made for the devil and all of his angels. But if we reject Christ, that's where we go. That's part of the counsel of the Word of God. Well, this morning, we're going to hit this part of the counsel, and that is money. Now, I'm relieved today that I'm not preaching this message because we're in a financial bad state. Because as far as I know, we're not. I'm not preaching this because we're out of money or or any of those things. I'm preaching this because God demands that we be obedient financially. He just does. He just does. Now, Money is one of those things that is on everybody's mind. I I will promise you, I hadn't been with all of you ever since you got up this morning, but I'm pretty sure that money has crossed our mind sometime since we've gotten up, even this morning. We may have passed our neighbor's house, and maybe they had a new house. Maybe they had a new truck, or maybe they had a new car. And we say, man, if I had money, I'd have one of those. If you've watched television, or if you watch television very often, you, you notice nowadays that a lot of our commercials, they're about investments, retirement funds, and Charles Schwab, he, he doesn't charge a, whatever the little thing is. that they, I, I, I'm not up on that. I have somebody do that for me, but he, it, it's some kind of a little fee. Some places charge $4.99, some charge $9.99. I don't know what others charge, but... But it's, it's, it's an investment thing. You pick up the telephone book, and here in the little, little town of Lufkin, I, I, I'm sure that I didn't count this right, but there are a dozen or so, maybe 15 different banks. And then if you count all the, all the banks that have branches, the number pretty close to doubles. So we've got all of those. We've got credit unions. We've got loan places. We've got, we've got financial investment people. And in fact, they fill up pretty much a page, if not more, of our yellow pages. Do, do you realize, let me, let me chase this rabbit just for a second. Do you realize that the people that are, let's say, 
10 or so years younger than me, that in a few years they're not going to know what in the world the yellow pages are. Do you realize that? Yeah, we, we, that's where we, we, coming up and you hear mom and dad ask a question about something, they'd always say, well, look in the yellow pages. We don't look in the yellow pages anymore. What do we do? We pull it out of our back pocket. And we can type the name of whatever it is, and it'll tell us where it is. It'll tell us the phone number, and then we hit another little button, and that sweet little woman that lives in my telephone, she'll say, Steve, if you'll turn right when you leave the parking lot, and then you get up to the loop and turn left or whatever it is, and she'll, she'll guide me there. So, so we don't know necessarily what the yellow pages are, but money is on our minds today. Now, I'm going to give you this message, because, not because we're in a great need, but because it's a part of our total obedience to God. I remember the very first time that I preached on tithing, and it was a series, and I preached it because I was, I was a very young pastor. I hadn't been pastoring very long, and we, were in, we, we didn't have any money. I mean, we had to go get a purchase order to go to town and buy a roll of toilet tissue or paper towel. That's the way that it was at that time. Well, I remember this one gentleman in our church. He came up to me. It was a series of about three or four sermons. And he came up to me and he said this. I'll never forget it. He said, if you preach on tithing one more time, he said, I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. Now, had I known then what I know today, I would have said, adios. So, but I didn't. I didn't. I tell you this morning that the Word of God has much to say about our stuff, our possessions, and about our finances. Now, I want to I share with you, now we're, we're not going to read this text, the Malachi part, until we're about halfway through. So just keep Keep a piece of paper there or something. Grab your outline and, and fill it in as we go. But let me share with you real quick about the world's viewpoint about money. And the world's viewpoint about money is very short. It can be summed up with the word accumulation. That is, gather all you can. Make all you can. Save all you can. Nothing, no, nothing wrong with making. There's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But the world's primary focus is self-interest. You watch, you watch the, the advertisers of our culture today, and they'll tell you to, to get all the, go for all of the gusto. Get all you can. Just do it. And it's all about you doing for you. That's the, world's, that's the world's viewpoint about giving. Make it up, plan it up, save it up so you can meet all of your personal desires. You can do all of the things you want to do, all your pleasures, all the security, and all of these things. And then when you get it made, do everything you can to protect it. That's the world's viewpoint on money. Let me give you God's viewpoint on money. Now, what we believe, uh, we, we have to come to the place where we agree with God. You don't ever have to agree with the preacher. But we must come to the place where we agree with God. And, and so let me share with you God's viewpoint on money. Now, here's, there's a blank on your outline, and here's what goes in that next blank. God owns it all. God owns it all. Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 24 and the first verse. It says, the earth is the Lord's. And then it says, and all its fullness. So everything that's on it, everything and everybody, they're his. The world and those who dwell therein. So here's what God in essence is saying. I own it all. I Googled early this morning. Everybody know what that is? It's not anything bad, those of you that don't know. You know there, there was a day when we had to call our daddy or our granddaddy or one of our elders, and we'd ask them those questions. Or you remember when, when, when we really thought we had it made when we had the World Book Encyclopedias? You remember that? 
Man, mom and dad bought a set of those world book encyclopedias when I was a kid. And yeah, we, we didn't have to take a dictionary home from school. We had the world book. Well, we don't do the world book anymore. We Google stuff. So I just typed in the question. I didn't type in the question for the world or, or even for America, but I, I just typed in the question, who are the largest landowners in the state of Texas? And here was the response. The King Ranch heirs are number one. They own 911,215 acres. Then there's a family known as the Briscoe family. Now, that's not, that's not the, the family on Andy Griffith. What, what's their name? Is it uh, Darlin Briscoe or something like that? It's not, it's not them. It's the family. If, you, if you're as old as I am, you remember we had a governor one time back in the mid-'70s, I think it was, by the name of Doff Briscoe. Well, he wasn't the one that headed up this family, but he's a member of that family, and their family owns 640,000. Then there's the O'Connor family. They own 580,000. The, the, I don't know how to say this last name, Cronky or Cranky or something like that. They have 510.5,000. The Bezos family has 400,000. The Hughes family has 390,000. The, the Mitchell family, 300 and some odd thousand. The Nunley family, 300,000. The Lano family. Partners have three, about 300,000. The Bass family has 285,000. And lo and behold, Steve and Donna Cowart were number 11 on that list with five acres. <laughs> and I can't even take care of five acres. I can't even begin to imagine what you'd do with, 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 with these others. But you know what the Bible tells us? And, and listen, one of the things that we learned about these convictions is we learn that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, and inerrant Word of a holy God. So that means that if the Word of God says it, it's so. And God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, spoke to the psalmist, and the psalmist wrote in Psalm 24, verse 1, that I own all of it. I don't just have 911,000. I have all of those acres of the top 10 families combined. All the money that's in all the banks, it's all mine. All the money that there is everywhere, it's all mine. Everything and everybody belongs to me. God owns it all. Then, then we're given this truth, and that truth is, is that we, now this includes me and you, we are stewards of God's money. We are stewards of God's money. So the, the scripture, the, is, this is not up for debate. The scripture just teaches us that the Lord owns it all. And, and what he blesses us with, and that comes in the, whether it's in the form of a retirement check that you get every month or whatever it may be, or a paycheck if you go to a job, what that is, is God blessing you. And, and listen, what, what you get that you're able to put in your, in your little wallet or your little billfold, that's really not yours. You're just a steward of it. You're just a steward. This is, this is, this is in Steve's wallet. And, and if we're just talking about it, Donna would say, how much money do you have? Well, I would, my answer would be, well, I've got, I got $25. That $25 is not mine. That $25 is his. Because according to the word of God, he owns every bit of it. Every bit of it he owns. And, and listen, we're just stewards. So what God is doing is God is entrusting us. He is entrusting us with those financial blessings, and we're just to manage those things. And listen, that other 90%, and we'll, we'll hit the tithe in a minute, but tithe is 10%. That's his. No question, no, no debate. It's not up for discussion. You don't need to go home and pray about it. I'm going to tell you, this is just what I believe, and there are preachers in the house. I may be wrong. You don't need to pray about tithing. Because the Word of God just says, do it. You don't need to pray about 
telling people about Jesus because the Word of God says do it. We're stewards. And that 90% that's left after we give our tithe, that's what we're stewards of. We're to manage that. And, and, and listen, that's not even just to do whatever we want to with it because he wants to guide us and direct us and lead us and help us even in the part that is not directly go to him. So, so God owns it all. And we are just stewards. That's God's viewpoint on money. Now, now what, what the Lord, what the, the key word, this not on your sheet, but the key word in, in the Lord's viewpoint of, about money is, I'm going to use this word, and it's the word distribute. Distribute. I don't know if you know this or not, but, but all the tithes and offerings, we, people give offerings through the Sunday school hour, and they we have an offering in the, in the worship service. We even have one on Wednesday evening in the, back in the fellowship hall. And, and people give money in a, in a variety of ways. Well, if, if you come to the quarterly business meeting, and, and if you take that sheet that we print that, that tells you this is how much came in, this is how much goes out, and all of this kind of stuff, and it, 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 honestly, it's kind of boring, just to be honest with you. But, but just so you know this, I want you to understand this. Your church, Trinity Baptist Church, we tithe. We tithe. There's a, there's a line, and I looked this morning just to make sure. I was, I was sure in my mind, but I wanted to look and see it. So I, so I got this financial statement that was laid on my desk this week, and, I, and I, found this, I found this line on that sheet, and it said this. 10% transfer from the general fund. Now what that means is this, is at the end of the month, all the offerings come in, and they equal X number. Well, when we come to the end of any given month, we take 10% the tithe, and we move it over into mission funds. And if you go to that big room back there on the back side of this building and you look around that room there are flags and there are flags from 32 different countries and nations around the world and I don't know if that's an exhaustive uh, picture of, of what we do but it's representative of there are people in those nations in those countries that are over there telling people about Jesus Christ and I want you to know that Trinity Baptist Church tithes to mission work all over the world. You should say amen because that's what we ought to do. But I'll tell you this. If it's right for us to do that corporately, it's right for us to do that personally. It's right personally. And, and listen, the, the world's view is get, 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 get. Accumulate, 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 accumulate. A part of God's plan is give, 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 give. Because I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not an expert on many things spiritual, but I do know this. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. Now, now let me give you, we've we got to get going here. There are two aspects of living. God gives a word of encouragement, and then God gives a, a, a word of warning. About this, about this giving. So, so, so you say, well, well, let's get, let's. It's kind of. I got good news and bad news. Which one you want? We. Let me give you the encouragement first. Okay. Now he 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 talks about generosity, and in doing so, he encourages his followers. He encourages the the believers by saying this in Luke six thirty eight: Give, and what will happen? It will be given to you. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Now here's the rest of that verse. For with the same measure that you use, that would be in our giving, the same measure that you use, it will be measured 
back to you. That didn't sit well, did it? But it's what the Word of God says. That's what the Word of God says. What we do with our money, what we do with our possessions, what we do with our finances determines what we're going to receive. That's just what the Bible says. Either we rely on ourselves, and if we rely on ourselves, we've got it. We've got to accumulate. We've got to get it. We've got to hoard it. We've got to keep it. We've got to grow it. We've got to do all of these things. Or we can give as God directs, and then he pours his blessing upon it. And I'm going to tell you this. When that happens, you will find out that that 90%, it will go so much farther than you ever dreamed that 100% to ever go. You say, why, preacher? It's because of the blessing of God. And I'm telling you this morning, God honors obedience. He just does. So he gives this word of encouragement. Give and it'll be given back to you. Here's the warning. And it comes out of 1 Timothy 6, beginning with the ninth verse. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Now understand this, there is nothing inherently wrong or inherently evil about money. We've all got to have some, don't we? The light company expects us to have a little. The water company expects us to have some. The place that holds the note to my new blue truck out there, they hope I have about three or four hundred dollars at the end of the month. I've really enjoyed driving that truck for the last month, but this week the first note comes to you, and I'm not, I'm not nearly as fond of it as I was last week. Because somebody, and I don't know where he is or she is or they are, but they're going to send a note in the mail, and that note's going to say, okay, big boy, mail us three or $400, and if you do, we'll let you drive it another month, and we're going to send you another note, and we're going to do that. Listen, it, 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 it's the love of money. Money is, money is not wrong. Money is not evil. But the scripture says it's the love of money. It's the longing of riches is where the problem comes in. But here's what the scripture goes on to say. And, and the Lord says in that same chapter, it, but in the 11th verse, 1 Timothy 6, 11, he says, but you. And then he says, just so we all know who the you are, he says, oh, man of God. So all of you who are born-again believers, he says, flee these things. You say, what things? The things that he talked about in verse 9 and the things that he talked about in verse 10. He says, flee those things. And then he gave us a list of one, two, three, four, five, six things to go after. He said, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. So we come down to a choice. We come down to a choice, and that choice is, am I going to do this God's way, or am I going to seek happiness the world's way? And I'll just go ahead and tell you, I don't have a lot of the world's wealth, but I have lived long enough to know this, that all of the world's wealth does not provide happiness. The world's wealth does not produce contentment because here's what happens in the world's way. The more you get, the more you want. And the more you think you need. And it's like that proverbial dog chasing its tail. The dog can never catch up to his tail. He just runs circles and circles, and that's what happens when we try to do it man's way. Man's way don't work. But bless God, God's way does. God's way works. And that brings us to our text. Malachi 3, he introduces God's master financial plan. 
Here's the way this passage of Scripture reads. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Now, just so you know, he's not talking about the nation of America. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Okay, that's, that's whom this is written to. But the principles and the application. They're just as true to you and I today as followers of the Lord Jesus as they were to the nation of Israel these thousands of years ago. And then it's this instruction beginning with the 10th verse. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then the Lord says something that we don't find. I'm going to say anywhere else. I don't think it's anywhere else. But he said this. He said, try me now in this. That word try could be test. So the Lord already knew. The Lord who is omniscient knows everything, everything that there is to know about everything. He knew that we were going to need encouragement. So he says in this matter of finances, he says, he says test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And then he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he, the devourer, will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says who? Says the Lord of hosts. Now let me give you, let me give you these four things that are on your outline that you need to, that you need to fill out. Number one, the Lord requires a tithe. He doesn't suggest it. He doesn't say, well, you know, it'd just kind of be a good idea. He requires it. The Lord requires a tithe, and, and tithe, is, tithe is 10%. Now, the, the reason that this is said is because the Israelites had failed to do this. You say, well, Brother Steve, isn't this, isn't this Old Testament stuff? And, and that's, you know, that's the time of the law and, and, and all of that stuff. And that's not applicable to us. You're wrong. You're just absolutely wrong. You see, we, we, we find the first tithing in Scripture, or that I'm aware of. In fact, we, we, we talked about it. We weren't on the subject of, of giving, but we talked about it two or three Sunday nights ago. And if you remember... Abram, he hadn't become Abraham at, at that time in Scripture. So Abram, he had gone off and he had done battle with a bunch of different kings. We, we named one of them Cheddar Cheese. That's not really his name, but it's Cheddar Laum or something like that. And he had gone and done battle and, and he, had, he had been successful. Well, he's on his way back and, and, and he, long story short, he runs into a guy. Scripture says a king by the name of Melchizedek. And, and when he meets up with Melchizedek, for the first time in Scripture, we read where somebody tithes. And Abraham, pay, Abram paid a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, you say, that's the law. No. The law is 400 years from coming when we're in Genesis, the 14th chapter. So it predates the law by at least 400 years. So we say, well, how, and, and, and keep in mind, Abraham doesn't have a copy of the Bible like you and I have. So he couldn't consult the book of Malachi. He couldn't consult the New Testament and the principles of giving that are written there. So we say, well, well how do he know? Here's what I believe. God. God spoke to his heart. 
and gave Abraham direction that this is what he needed to do. 400 years before it appeared in the, in the law as we know it. And, 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 and the Word of God institutes the practice of tithing. And listen, the Scripture does tell us that he's the same. Past, present, future. And brethren, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box. I wasn't in, the, I wasn't in the honor grads as some of the others out of my graduating class probably were. I was one of those that it was just an honor for me to get to graduate. They graduated cum laude, I graduated praise the laude. But I'll tell you this, he hadn't changed. He owns it all. But God, in his infinite, matchless, unending wisdom, has chosen to run his church. And you heard what I said right. This church does not belong to any of us. This is his church. And he has chosen to run his church and to run the ministries, children, youth, young adult, missions, even though he owns it all. The cattle on a thousand hills that the Bible talks about, they're his. But he chooses to run his ministry through the obedience of the people to whom he has saved their soul and granted them eternal life in this place that he's going to prepare. I want you to know this morning that it seems like in our culture today that everybody gets a check from the government. I thought about the school across the road. And I'm going to tell you, it, it has to be expensive to operate that school. I don't know how many teachers there are, but there's a bunch of them. There's all those buildings. Somebody's got to cut the grass. There's a bunch of grass to cut over there. Somebody's got to come in in the evening and clean up so they can come back the next day. Well, the school, and, I, and I'm not an expert on school finance, but I, I do know this. The, the school gets money per daily attendance. The school gets money out of, if you're a landowner or a property owner, you pay taxes. And most of us are in agreement that it's too much. But them people across the road over there, they'd say, it ain't enough. That's the way that works over there. I want you to understand this morning that the church doesn't get a check from the government. We, we don't get a check mailed in from, from the government at, at the beginning or the end of a given month. The church operates and the ministries continue through the tithes and the offerings of we the people. These lights, and I, I'm going to tell you, man, we, we changed them all a few weeks ago. We sent Bob up there. We didn't figure Bob was going to heaven anyway, so we got him as close as we could. We put him in a lift and said, Bob, enjoy it. It's close you're going to get, man. And he liked it so well. The other day, he and I came in here, and he got up on that 20-foot ladder and way up yonder and did all of that. There's a bunch of lights in here. I just imagine we probably got 25 or 30 air conditioners. That when you walk in here on any given Sunday morning, just about all 25 or 30 of them are humming. The power company doesn't send a notice out and say, well, since you're a church, you know, God's going to bless you and all this. We, we, we pay an electric bill and a water bill just like everybody else does. And all of that happens through the obedience of God's people. That's the way it happens. And listen, that is the way that God ordained it to happen. We pay salaries. 
that that was a part of the original deal about giving in the first place so that the priest could be taken care of, so that there would be food in the house. The Lord requires a tithe. Here's, here's the second. Oh, there's my clock. It moved it. I'm almost in a panic. God's blessings overflow when we give. God's blessing. Here's verse 10. Let me read it again. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in, and, and that my is capitalized, my house. And then he says, try me now in this, says the Lord. And, and bless God, I can't tell you how this happens. And I can't tell you why it happens other than to say because he said it would. But I'm telling you it happens. And then he said, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, if you come to me at the door when we're done and you say, Brother Steve, how's that possible? Let me tell you my answer. I don't know. I don't know. Other than it's just what the Word of God says. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how those things happen, but I'm telling you, I, 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 we don't have a lot. But I will tell you this, God is true to his Word. I, and I'm not going to bore you with the details, but there has been time in our life and, and now we're just poor. Do you remember when you was poor? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of difference in those two places in our life. But I can remember those times when, when, when we moved to Mississippi to, to do ministry there one time, and Donna took a bunch of stuff to a resale shop, and we, there were times when a little check would come in the mail, and that little check might be 15 or $20. And I'm going to tell you, there was a time when 15 or $20 was huge. And every time when there wasn't anything left in the wallet, when there wasn't anything left in the checkbook, in would come this little check from Miss Frankie Bickley's resale shop. Remember when she had that up there at Central? It'd come this little old check in the mail for $12.47 or whatever the case was. You say, well, that's, isn't that coincidental? No, it is not coincidental. It is God blessing and honoring his word God honored obedience in the Old Testament God honors obedience in the New Testament God honored obedience in my grandparents life God honors obedience in my life and God will honor obedience until time ends and he doesn't just a dollar for dollar thing he tells us in this verse, and he says, I will open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing that your cup is not big enough to hold. And can I get a witness that he does? Man, that's what, that's what God does. He requires a tithe. He blesses to the overflow when we give. And then, I've already mentioned this, but let me mention it one more time. God invites us to test him in the area of giving. He invites us, here's part of verse 10, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. I think that that's written because it, it was probably true of the Israelites in this day of, of Scripture. And, and God knows that it was, it was going to be an issue for us. So he speaks and he says, you can test me in this. You can, you can try me in this. Now, now listen, let, let, let me go ahead and tell you. You're not going to be able to figure this out. You're not going to be able to take a pencil and, and put something on one side of a ledger and something on the other and come to a conclusion where it's, where it's all figurable because it won't be. I'm just telling you this morning that God always has and always will honor the obedience of his people. That's the way God works. And, and, and God does something else. He protects those who give. He protects those who give. In verse 11 of our text, he said this, and he said, And I, God, 
will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not be able to destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. Again, says the Lord of hosts. Listen, it may sound or it may seem risky to follow God's instruction. And it may, we may be at a place in our life where we say, well, if I had what so-and-so had, then I would do that. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Because I'm going to tell you how this works. If we won't tithe out of a $10 bill, which that would be $1, we won't tithe out of $1,000. That's why, listen to me, parents, grandparents. You need to begin to teach your children. If you give them a $10 allowance per week, you teach them to give God his portion. And when they can do that out of $10, and then they get to where they make 100 then they get to where they make 1000 Then they get to where they make $100,000 a year. You know what they're going to be able to do? They're going to be able to give out of that $100,000 because you taught them to give out of 10. You say, well, I kind of wasted my time. I hadn't come today if I'd known he was going to talk about this. I'm going to tell you this. And I tell you this, I'm not looking down my nose. I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm just, I'm just speaking as honestly as I can. God demands obedience in the area of our money because it's His. It's His. You say, no, preacher, it's mine. Because I get up every morning and I go to work. Well, you remind yourself of this, that you get up every morning and go to work because God has blessed you to be able to get up in the morning and go to work. God blessed you and he has has touched your health. Listen, there are people, and, and, and I'm coming to find out there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people who can't get up in the morning and go to a job. There's a lot of people who don't have the health to get up and go make a way. And the reason that we're able to do that is because God has blessed us. And the reason that happens is, I I believe, because God has blessed wherever our money comes from through, through the realm of an employer, God has blessed that person to be able to give to you to do a job. There's no way you can chase this thing that we don't wind up at God. There's no no way that we can run this thing down that we don't wind back up at the same place and it's that God is the provider of everything. And he demands that we, his people, give. Give. And he instructs us how. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I preached this subject when it was needed because there was no money in the coffers. And as a pastor, it's much easier to preach this message just because it's it's a word of obedience. It's what God tells his people to do. And I'd much rather preach it in this realm than I have in the realms that I've had to do it before. And I'm just telling you this morning, I don't have to tell you this because he has already told us through his word. You honor him, and he'll bless you. You say, well, preacher, he already blesses us. Well, he doesn't bless you as he could or as he would. 
Because he said in, in one of the verses that's tucked away there, he says, I put a curse on you. In other words, I have not blessed you as much as I could have blessed you or would have blessed you if you had been obedient. We want to walk in obedience. But we can't walk in full obedience if the Lord is not the Lord of this part of our life. A lot of times, and I've heard this, and I've probably said it, and and I misspoke. That when somebody walked the aisle to trust Christ, we say they've come to accept Christ accept him as their Lord and Savior. That's not right. They've come to accept him as their Savior. He becomes Lord through the process of time. There are still areas of Steve Cowart's life. I've I've, I've been in ministry for 30-some-odd years, and there are still areas of my life that I am still surrendering lordship. And it's it's an ongoing day-by-day thing that he is still becoming lord of different areas of my life. And I'm going to tell you, if you want his blessing, you sit around and you say, Lord, we, we need a financial miracle. Let me tell you how to implement that financial miracle. You give God what belongs to God. So, said, preacher, I'm already in this. I, I'm just telling you. You give God what belongs to God, and God will do with that other portion what you could never do with it. May God honor his word and honor our obedience as we seek to make him Lord of our finances. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us. Not speaking in a dictatorial manner. Not speaking as one who is just hoarding over us, but speaking in love to us, your people, about this subject of finance. Lord, I realize this morning that in this room there are people that are in need of what we would call a financial miracle. And that financial miracle does not come with somebody just walking up and handing a roll of cash. But that financial miracle begins when we begin to follow you obediently with our tithes and our offerings. God, what an honor it is that you allow us to be a part of your kingdom. And then as your people that we're able to be a part of the furtherance of your kingdom through the work of missions, through the work of children, through the ministries of youth, through the ministries of families, through all the different things that the church does and all the different places that that we go and have ministries, that we're all a part of that through our giving. Lord, we go to hospitals, we go to nursing homes, we go to funeral homes, we go to places where people are hurting and they're downing out, and all of those things happen because of our obedience to you. God, I ask you, please, to honor your preached word this morning. This is not about Steve. This is not about the staff. This is not about the finance committee. This is not about even Trinity Baptist Church. It's about our obedience to a holy, loving God. Speak to our hearts. Lead us in this area of our life. I pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn of invitation.